Mike Lynette has announced retirement from full-time racing in NASCAR for after 2021. Big Machine Racing has announced a major partnership with Richard Childress Racing. And Stockholm Racing may not be shutting down after all. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We've got a ton of NASCAR story to discuss here today on the channel. Well, let's go and just jump straight into those really, really quickly. We're going to start off with Scott Heckard. As Scott Heckard is going to be driving a 78 for Lit Fast Motorsports this weekend at the Shaw Roval. Originally, Kyle Tilly was in the original entry list for this ride, but Austin Konetsky had originally reported a couple days ago that, he, that it was going to be Scott Heckard's in the ride, and they announced today from Live Fast Motorsports that he will be driving this car. I think Scott Heckard overall is a much better driver on road courses than Kyle Tilly. It's not saying Kyle Tilly is a really bad road course racer, but I do think that Scott Heckard is going to bring a lot more to the organization going into this weekend. I do think that Scott Heckard could finish in the top 30. He's ran pretty well with some smaller teams. He was actually being, I believe, for top 30 at the Daytona Road Course for all hell break loose. So I'm hoping he can really do really, really well. I'm glad to see that Scott Heckard is back and wishing for the best of luck this weekend when we go racing because it'd be really, really cool to see him get an opportunity to run really well this weekend. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the starting lines for the Cup Series and the Xfinity Series races this weekend at the Star Bowl. Let's first take a look at the Xfinity Series starting lineup for this weekend, as Austin Hendrick is going to be starting on the pole for this weekend's race at the Charlotte Roval. Now, my pick going into this weekend is going to be A.J. Allmendinger, as A.J. Allmendinger has won the last few times he's been at the Charlotte Roval. Of course, last year was a race that was rain. He had a lot of people having issues and a lot of different leaders in that event. But there is also rain in the forecast again this weekend. So I'm really, really confident that we're going to see a win from A.J. Allmendinger this weekend. I think he gets it done. Now let's take a look at the Cup Series starting line for this weekend at the Shaw Roval. Denny Hamlin is going to be starting on the pole. Of course, Denny Hamlin's coming off a win at Vegas, and he ran really, really well at Talladega. So, of course, he's going to be able to start up front, and he'll be up front as a traditional. Well, I think he's actually also a traditional points leader, not to mention. My pick to win the race is going to be Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott's one of the last two times he's been here at the Shaw Roval, and, of course, he's been the best road course racer. Of course, I do think that he is going to overall have competition from guys like Kyle Larson and Martin Trish Jr. and even A.J. Allmendinger, who will be competing in the Cup Series race. But I do think at the end of the day, we're going to see Chase Elliott pick up the victory. But those are your starting lines for the Cup Series and the Xfinity Series races at the Shaw Roll. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Joey Hand. As it was reported by TobyChristie.com that a Rick Rowe Racing representative have told them that they have a Stuart Haas Racing Repair car for Joey Hand while he will be driving for Rick Rowe Racing. Now remember, Joey Hand will be making his NASCAR Cup Series debut. Now the reason apparently they are giving him an SHR Repair car is this is apparently a deal with Ford Performance. And of course, Ford Performance is helping a lot with the funding to make sure he's able to go out there and race. I'm really happy to say that Joey Hans getting an opportunity. And I do think that pace-wise, I really think that this car actually will run a lot better than the traditional Rick Ware cars. I'm not saying this car is going to win. I'm not even saying this car is going to finish in the top 10. But there is potential that a Rick Ware racing car on pace could be running in the top 20 this weekend. I would not entirely be shocked. Again, it'd be really, really cool to see Joey Hand run really, really well. I think Joey Hand is one of the best road course racers out there in the world. These guys won a lot of races with every other sport. He's just won about just about everything you can win in racing. So, it's great to see that this is happening overall for Joey Hand, that he is getting an SHR prepared car. I think it's great for him, and it will be really, really beneficial to Rick Racing. And this will probably help the 52 car in owner's points. Josh Blinken will be in the 15, so this will help in the owner's points for that 52 to make sure they're in a much better position going into the future of the charter system. Because remember, Rick Racing is back to the downside. So hopefully Joey Hand will have a good run this weekend. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about the 2021 Drive for Diversity Awards, which took place a couple days ago. So I want to look at a few of the big awards. So first one, developmental drivers. Roger Carruth, who's been doing really well in the late models and also has been doing well in the ARCA East Series so far this year, coming off of a podium finish. He won an award. Also, Tony Bridinger, who was the first Lebanese American driver to race in NASCAR ever. They were both able to win developmental driver awards. National Driver Award, this should surprise nobody, Bubba Wallace. Of course, Bubba Wallace is coming off of a win this past weekend at Talladega. So it makes a ton of sense for Bubba Wallace to win that award. Team, this one is also kind of not surprising me, Trackhouse Racing. Trackhouse Racing has shown a lot. Of course, you have Pitbull, who currently owns the organization, is one of the owners for the team. And you also have Daniel Suarez, who's been driving the organization all year. Now, they're going to be getting Ross Chastain next year, but he was able to win that award for Trackhouse Racing. Track. National Super Speedway. The reason that National gets this award is because Eric Moses, who is currently the president, and he's also African-American, so he's able to win that award for National Super Speedway. I know they have parking issues, but they were able to sell out and have full capacity for that event. 
which is really surprising. And finally, young racer, Regina Serva. Regina Serva has competing in the NASCAR Weekly Auto Zone Auto Series. I don't know exactly what the series is called nowadays, but she's been competing in that and has been able, I think, to win one of those races, and she's been coming up through the ranks, a very talented young driver who has potential to do very, very well. Congratulations to all the, the people that won awards. There were more awards that were won by people. So to all the people that won Drive for Diversity Awards, huge congratulations. NASCAR's been heading in that direction. I really like this way that the sport is going in that direction. I think it's great for the sport for sure. And now we're going to move on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about NBC and Pe Peacock. Now, this was the first initial reported by Jennifer, Fryer, but a lot of reporters started coming out that the final three NASCAR races that are scheduled for NBC will, are also going to be televised on Peacock, which those, of course, those races are Texas, Martinsville, and Phoenix. This means that Kansas is going to be the last time we're going to see a NASCAR Cup Series race televised on NBC Ascent. For those races as well, the pre-race and the post-race coverage for those events is going to be moved over to Peacock as well. Now, I see what a lot of people are saying, and they're saying, oh, they're moving the races over to Peacock. They're going to be behind a streaming paywall. That's not the case whatsoever. What this is, is NBC is trying to go ahead, and because remember... NBCSN, NBC Sports Network, is going to be shutting down at the end of this year. Again, we have we, this, I think, is really one of the big indicators at this point, that NBCSN is getting ready to shut down their programming at the end of this year. NASCAR is expecting to move a lot of their race network, NBCSN, over to USA Network. In NASCAR's current contract, the clause that they have at the particular moment in the contract that they signed for the TV, no races can get behind a streaming service. Now, of course, there have been reports recently, executives have been saying, that likely there will be some aspects of streaming, but that does not mean races are going to be behind a paywall. And I do think that this is a really good move, especially for people that are trying to cut back a little bit. Peacock is a really, really cheap service. It's not really a lot of money, and I believe it's free if I'm not mistaken. I think you have to pay a little bit of money, but it is, it is free to watch these races, so it really doesn't cost you anything to purchase these events. So I don't believe that these races are going to be commercial free, unfortunately, which I think you're still going to watch commercials. I think if you're on Peacock, you shouldn't have to watch for commercials, but one thing this is going to do for Peacock is it's going to increase the amount of people that are buying the streaming service. Now, I think that if they were done this like a little bit ago, I think that Peacock only has like 100,000 to 200,000 downloads or something like that. They have a lot of uh, people that do buy the service, but they're going to increase the amount of people that are going to get service. And I think this helps on another aspect toward their future for NBC. And I do think that this also is going to have implications for the future as a whole. What these implications are, you may ask. I do think that they are going to start putting some of their stuff behind the Peacock stuff. They're going to be putting it behind the paywall, of course, which is really, really unfortunate. But it does look like what this means for the future is going to be a pre-race and post-race coverage is probably going to be behind a paywall going forward. Definitely interesting. It's very important to that we discussed that today. Definitely really interesting that that is going on for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're talking about Brett Griffin. As Brett Griffin announced on the Door Bumper Clear Packers on Wednesday that he will be spotting full-time in 2022. He will be coming out of retirement, and he'll be spotting for Daniel Hemrick full-time in the Xfinity Series when Daniel Hemrick moves over to the 11 car, and he will be spotting for Justin Haley in the Cup Series going into next year. Brett Griffin announced about a year ago that he would be retiring from full-time spotting after 2020 after his announcement Clint Boyer would be moving away from working in NASCAR as a driver up to the Fox Sports booth to work in Fox's NASCAR coverage. He has been, however, making a few starts as a spotter here and then. I believe he's been spotting for Cavs Girl in the Cup Series this year, and he's also making a couple one-offs with people like Jeb Burton. I think even a couple other drivers have driven for Colic. He's been spotting for them. He's been working with the Colic organization. While a lot of you may not be a fan of one of his takes, I think that when it comes to Brett Griffin, I think Brett Griffin is an excellent spotter. He's spotted for quite some time. He knows what he's doing behind there, and I think it's going to be a great to see him coming back overall into NASCAR. I think this also is going to help a driver like Daniel Hemrick. I think Brett Griffin is a guy that's, that knows how to get it done and really help. And Brett Griffin's also a guy that can give, be humorous, but all at the same time can keep you on the same page and help you do a good job as a spotter. So I'm really happy to see that Brett Griffin overall is coming back to the spotting game. I think it's going to be also great for Justin Haley going into next year. And I think that this is what Chris Rice is doing. Chris Rice is looking for really good spotters to bring into the sport to help out teams like them going in the next year in the Cup Series. And I think that Brett Griffin is definitely the perfect option. It takes them off the potential of going over 23-11. But I think it's great to see that they're going to get Brett Griffin next year for college racing. I think it's great overall for the sport, and I'm really happy about it for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about the engine package. Now, somebody had asked in regards to the engine package going forward for NASCAR, and Bob Pock was reporting that the current engine is still going to be used for next-gen in 2022 and 2023, and expected for 2023. 
Any change likely will be from 2024 or later. Now, we've talked about this quite a few times on the channel in regards to the engine package. Now, NASCAR had initially a few years ago, they wanted to release a new engine in 2022. But because of COVID, unfortunately, there has been more pushback. They pushed it back in 20, last year to 2023. And now you're talking about 2024 and maybe as early as 2025 when we may see a new engine package overall in NASCAR. I know that this is very, very controversial and very frustrating. A lot of fans do want a new engine, which another big thing, aspect of this is that they may end up using the same taper spacers that we use, maybe the 550 and the 750. Now, it is currently being rumored right now that the next-gen car's engines all around are going to be 650 horsepower, which I believe the NASCAR Xfinity Series, they currently at this moment use about 650 horsepower. And the racing has been absolutely fantastic in many other races here, including on the intermediate tracks. Though, I think it's definitely interesting that the, they're not is not going to be a new engine going forward, at least the foreseeable future. I think it does have a big effect long-term for many, many, many reasons. And I think it's really important for sure that we did talk about things. I think it's really, really important. And now we're going to move on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about some upcoming Daytona next-gen tests that are going to be happening really, really soon. First one, and this is the big one, the Daytona next-gen test. So the Chili Bowl announced their schedule for next week, and they're going to be having their big champions night on January 10th for the drivers that are going to be in the champions night. They are moving up from that Tuesday over to that Monday on my birthday, January 10th. And the reason that this is going to be the case is because the Daytona next-gen test is going to be taking place from January 11th to January 12th. Now, we have been wondering when the date is going to be for this next gen test, but now it looks like it's going to be about three or four weeks before the season does begin overall. Because remember, they're going to be starting the season on at the LA Coliseum in for the LA Clash in, I think, February 6th, I think, is the date for the LA Clash, which is going to be on a Sunday evening. I think that this is a good, really good to see if they're going to be happening on January 11th to 12th. It's believed that there's going to be about 25 to 20, 25, or even more drivers and more teams that are going to be showing up. You're probably going to have all full organizations that are going to be there. That's in regards to the other next gen tests. Now jumping into the other two next gen tests that we do not currently know at the moment. So there will be a test at the Charlotte Oval in some point in October, and there's also going to be a Phoenix test that's going to be taking place at some point about a week or two after the championship. Unclear how many cars are going to be showing up at those specific tests, but I do get to think it's it extremely important that NASCAR has more tests. I think with NASCAR in general, in regards to how many tests they're having, I think they're doing a much better job into that. One thing going in regards to the next test, I want to see them get figured out as a heating situation, because that's one thing that a lot of drivers, including Denny Hamill, multiple drivers, have said that they really are concerned about. But they said that NASCAR probably... We'll be able to figure that out going forward. To me, I am overall really, really excited. I mean, I'm definitely intrigued about the next gen car. Again, I don't think the next gen car has to absolutely be perfect right away, and it's not going to be perfect right away. There's still going to be some kinks and bugs with the next gen car going forward. But to me, over time, they've got to make this next gen car as good as possible. Again, if people are expecting to be good the first year, I think that they're dreaming. It's probably not going to be good right away. That being said, though, I think it's really, really important that we do have these tests to make sure everything's going right and we don't have any kinks and bugs. I think it's really great for the sport that they are testing this car, and we'll see a couple next-gen tests going forward really soon. Now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Xfinity Series practice and qualifying. Now, Mark Kressler, who's currently a contributor for Cash, Fence, and Front Church, he says that Xfinity Series pick member says, Right now, the format for next season is 20 minutes of practice and qualifying right after practice. This is very, very similar to what NASCAR Cup Series is currently at the moment. This is in a Facebook group. A pick, remember that he did not disclose who said this. He said that this is going to be the case going forward for Xfinity Series next year. Hey, at least it's something right for Xfinity because there have been rumors that the Xfinity Series is probably only going to have eight braces with practice and qual well, only eight races of practice qualifying. So at least it's a little bit better. But I want to say one thing overall in regards to this talk about practice qualifying for Cup and Xfinity. I personally do not like the decision of only having 20 minutes of practice because that's not overall really a practice session. That's like a glorified practice session. I think someone has said this on YouTube basically that what this is like is when the World of Allies do a few hot laps and then they go and get the race green. That's not a practice session. To me, Again, we have proven over the last year or two that we don't need three practice sessions. I personally think we need one happy hour practice session for 45 minutes. And then, if you want to, you then can jump into qualifying right after that. Now, the theory behind the reason is because apparently NASCAR doesn't want to do a bunch of tech. But here's the thing. You do a tech before practice, and then right after qualifying is over, you then go ahead and tech the car. Because I think that would be a lot more logical sense. But NASCAR sometimes 
does not use their brain in regards to when it comes to the testing. Again, we have proven time and time again that we don't need a ton of practice sessions, but at the same time, to me, we need a little bit more practice in 20 minutes, especially for some of these guys that are coming into the series. I wonder if Trucks is going to be in a similar situation, which I think the Truck series, they need a much longer practice session considering, and I think this year has overall proved that, and even last year has proved that, with how much aggressive these drivers are. I think a little bit extra practice for these teams, I think it would have made a much better contribution and a much better factor to not as many wrecks happening. In trucks this year, I think drivers would know how what they're doing. Look back at Nashville. There weren't that many really big incidents because a lot of drivers had a lot of practice time on the racetrack. To me, it's definitely really interesting for sure. We'll have to wait and see what happens in regards to that. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. As we're going to talk about track house racing as it was reported by the Charlotte Observer that Trackhouse Racing is expected to employ at least 100 plus former Chip Ganassi Racing employees from the NASCAR side of things into their organization. Now, currently Chip Ganassi Racing says they have about 120 to 150 employees currently that are probably potentially expected to jump into the Trackhouse Racing organization. Justin Marks had said a few weeks ago, but actually really when this was revealed that Trackhouse was going to be doing this about a couple of months ago when they were buying up Chip Ganassi Racing's Cup operation, that they had basically reported they were expected to do this. They were expected to bring as many people from Chip Ganassi Racing, and this, of course, includes uh, Ross Chassin, who's going to be driving for Trackhouse Racing next year as well. I really like Justin Marks as a person. I think Justin Marks is what he's doing here, bringing as many people from the Chip Ganassi Racing Camp and the organization is really, really cool. Now, my big question in regards to the future is what happens to these other employees that are not able to find a job in the Trackhouse Racing Camp? Because if they're not able to find employment in the Trackhouse Racing Camp, where do they go to? I think that the other Chip Ganassi Racing employees, probably the people that work on the one car, which includes Kurt Busch, I am expecting that they will probably, going into next year, they will probably go over to Kurt Busch. I also am expecting Matt McCall, who's the current crew chief for Kurt Busch in the Cup Series, to be the guy who's going to be the crew chief for Kurt Busch going into next year. So to me, I'm really excited about the future track house racing. The future seems promising. I know that the last five or six weeks have not been great for the organization with a lot of their engine issues and mechanical problems. And that's something that they're going to have to fix going forward in regards to the future. But I do think it's really, really good. I'm really happy that at least a lot of people are probably going to go to ch track house racing next year that are unemployed at the moment. I think it's overall great for the sport as a whole. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about the L.A. Coliseum. Now, there was a new policy that was added just this past week with L.A. Of course, there's increased number of COVID cases in the L.A. area, and quite a few deaths have been happening in L.A. with COVID-19. There's new policies in regards to L.A. Now, in places that, have, that are considered mega events, which has 10,000 people, right now they are going to require vaccination cards if the policy stays up until February. Now, another important thing you know from that, you could also can need that if you're not don't have a vaccine, you have to, if you're gonna go to these events, you have to provide a negative COVID test within 72 hours. This does not surprise me. It's California. California, in regards to their policies when it comes to COVID-19, them and New York are two of the most strict states when it comes to COVID-19. I believe for the Long Beach Grand Prix, the actor of Long Beach GP, I think for the season finale there. I think they were requiring you to have vaccine vaccination cards to get in, or you had to provide a COVID case. Apparently, people, they have been a little bit lax in regards to that, as not much people were saying they weren't as mad at you if you didn't have it. You just had to make sure you had a negative test within 72 hours to get into the event. They were still able to bring a ton of people into the Long Beach GP. I'm not entirely surprised by this. It's LA. I'm not, I'm getting, I'm not entirely surprised. I do hope that we can get the COVID cases down, especially in the LA area, so we can get rid of this policy so people don't have to worry about it. Stuff. I understand 100% though what they're doing. You got to go for the health and safety factor. I think it makes a lot of sense as a whole. And I think, again, they're trying to be as healthy and safety as they can. And it makes a lot of sense going forward. Really important to me that they keep on this and make sure that everyone keeps their health and safety. I think it's really, really important. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. As we're talking about Eddie Traconis. As Eddie Traconis has been suspended indefinitely by NASCAR for basically having actions outside of the sport. Again, it's unknown how long. It's indefinitely going to be suspended. But apparent, I was very, very confused when this guy asked me again. I'll be honest. I was very surprised that Eddie Traconis was being suspended by NASCAR. Apparently, from what has been reported, he apparently had been in a physical altercation with a member of another race team. I would say perhaps it maybe was the 75 organization because according to multiple reports, apparently Eddie Traconis is the husband of Jennifer Jo Cobb. And if you've been paying attention, 
Jennifer Jo Cobb had basically T-boned Parker Kligerman into the side. Parker Kligerman was not very happy with Jennifer Jo Cobb. He went on Twitter and kind of went off on her where she said he had 18 seconds to basically wait for her him to go. And she just went in straight and Arca breaked it and basically wrecked into Parker Kligerman. To me, I think it absolutely, I, I'm I'm not surprised. I've seen a lot of craziness this year, and I'm just surprised that Asker is suspending him indefinitely. I want, again, apparently there have been maybe some tires that have been thrown or something. I'm not entirely sure what happens. This story is definitely one of the most shocking things that I've seen. That, well, not the most shocking thing I've seen this year. I've seen a lot more surprising things. It's 2021. I've seen a lot of crazy things this year. But this is definitely really, really shocking to me that Eddie Traconis has been indefinitely suspended by NASCAR. Again, it's unclear when he'll probably come back. I would assume for sure that Eddie Traconis will probably not be crew chief if thieving. And the other big question is what happens in regards to the crew chief of that 2 truck? Because that 2 truck is going to need a crew chief. Is Tyler Young, who basically is the owner, is he going to basically end up taking over as a crew chief going forward? Is he going to be the guy that's replacing and working with them on Eddie Chirconis' gun? It's very unclear at the moment. I would assume Eddie Chirconis will probably get reinstated over time. But it's definitely interesting that Eddie got suspended indefinitely by NASCAR for getting in regards to fighting and all that stuff. And again, as with COVID, especially with COVID-19 still being a thing that's adamant in NASCAR, they're not going to be as really a, a gun shy. Again, NASCAR really likes fights but at the same time. I don't think NASCAR is wanting these drivers to get into physical confrontations because we still have a COVID-19 virus still going on at the particular moment. So it's definitely interesting that this happened, and it's very interesting for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. As we're going to talk about the Talladega TV ratings from this past weekend. And honestly, they're not very promising, but we'll get into why I think there's a few factors in regards to that. And it's not as bad as people are saying, making it out to be. So, according to Adam Stern... NBCSN earned a 0.77 rating and 1.16 million viewers for Monday's rescheduled Cup Series race at Talladega, which was won by Bubba Wallace. Now, again, these ratings do not look very, very promising. However, I want to bring some a couple things up, factors to why it's bad. First of all, the race is postponed to Monday. You're going to lose a lot of your viewership on Monday. Second reason, this race is moved to NBC Sports Network on a Monday. And again, when people go to, we have people that are going to work and people going to school and stuff. And when this race initially was restarting and they got the race going on Monday, it was in the middle of the afternoon. And like I said, you had a lot of people doing college. There were people that reported that basically said that they were watching the race in college and there were not as many people that were able to watch at home and were not able to be able to watch the event at home and had to wait till later to get home for the event. The other big thing is that this race had a rain delay in the middle of the race. Because remember, there was a rain delay that happened at 74 laps into the event. And a lot of people decided to turn it off. And a lot of people thought at that, probably at that time, with the rain delay, they're gonna you're going to lose a lot of your viewership that is going to tune out. Of course, your hardcore fan base is probably going to still end up watching. But the other big thing is that the race ended up stopping once again. You had about 30 minutes for an and overall decided to declare for the victory. So it's really tough to say this is, a, this, again, this is a loss for the sport. But at the same time, it's really tough to say if this is really negative because, again, you did have it. My big question going into next week with all the coverage that Bell Walsh has gotten going into this week at the Charlotte Roval, my big question is, is that this is this going to have a positive impact? Is Bubba going to be able to increase how many people are going to be able to watch sports? I'll be honest. I think with Bubba Walls being able to win the race past week in Talladega with all the media coverage he's gotten as a whole, I do overall think that this will have a much more positive impact. I do think you're still going to see increase of viewership. It's unclear how many people are going to be watching this week, and because I do think you're going to still have a lot of people that are going to watch the event. But I think it's definitely interesting that we're gonna that NASCAR did only have 1.16. Again, it's not really that great, but at the same time, it's really tough to say if this is a, a loss for NASCAR. Is again, a ratings. It also is the first time in six or seven weeks that NASCAR had negative trends, but unfortunately, the rain had affected potentially one of the big weekends that had Bubba Walsh won the race and we had no issues of rain. We probably would have seen the ratings up much higher than they currently are at the moment. So it's definitely really interesting that this has happened and. Really interesting because, again, the ratings won't, are down this weekend. But like I said, they were, unfortunately, we had rain in effect the weekend as a whole. And now we're going to jump on to the next major story of today's episode. As we're talking about Michael and Dreddy. Now, I'm talking about F1 story because this has major implications into the U.S. racing side of things. Now, according to Adam Cern, Michael and Dreddy is reportedly nearing a deal for around $400 billion, which is 80% into the stake of buying Sauber's racing organization. there have, If you have not been paying attention to the IndyCar world, this stuff started getting reporting back as early 
as I think back in August during the Gateway Weekend. And apparently there have been reporters that asked Michael and Andretti about this, and he said they had denied and no comments said that at the time he was not getting into it. But as time has gone on, more reports have come out about this potentially happening. I want to say this. I think that this is really, really huge. If this officially does go down in any time, I think that this is going to be really, really good overall for the Alfa Romeo organization to bring in a person like Michael Andretti. And I do think that this has another major implication, and this has maybe had some implications in the NASCAR world, because in the United States, we have been seeing a huge increase in people that have been getting in Formula One. We've seen a lot more viewership. Of course, I do think it helps with the Drive and Survive series. I think that that overall as a whole has been able to help the series grow. And they've been getting a lot of races, especially this year, into over the 1 million range. You've had a lot of people that have been able to overall watch these events as a whole. So to me, I think it makes a lot of sense what they're doing here to, for Michael Andretti. I think it makes a lot of sense. My big question right now is what if there are American drivers going forward that drive for this team? What American drivers are going to drive? This could potentially bring someone like a Colton Herta, perhaps, into the team. Now, I do think that Colton Herta is still going to wind up staying in IndyCar because I think he has much better comp potential to be competitive at Andretti in IndyCar than he currently does being competitive in F1. Because right now, one of the big issues is the reason a lot of American drivers and a lot of drivers are abandoning F1. They're coming over to IndyCar right now. Is IndyCar is is much more competitive field right now. You have a lot of teams that can win on a week by week basis. The issue with F1 right now is F1 is only two or three really competitive teams. You have basically the Red Bull team, and then you got the Mercedes, and then you have McLaren that's right behind them, and that's really about it. And maybe sometimes you have Ferrari who's competitive, and maybe a couple other organizations like uh, Alpine Racing that can be really competitive points and kind of steal wins overall as a whole. To me, it's definitely really interesting as a whole that this is happening because again, I, I find again it's definitely interesting for sure. That Michael Andretti has basically basically looking to get into the F1 side of things. Again, it's been reported for a while that this is probably going to happen. It's definitely, I mean, I want to see it happen. I absolutely do. I think the more American presence he can get in F1, there's been talk maybe even for a while now. That there may be three F1 races. There's been talk there may be a race in Las Vegas. And I do think that the American audience are getting a much better, bigger, bigger American audience. And the more American fans he can get in the sport overall to me the better it is a whole. But this is definitely really, really interesting reports, and hopefully this will have a good impact going forward for Formula One. Now we're going to jump on to the first of three major stories of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Big Machine Racing. I was reported yesterday that Big Machine Racing has announced a major enhanced partnership with Richard Childress Racing. Jay Beaver will be returning to the organization next year. He'll still continue driving the 48 car. However, what's really big about this move is that they are going to be getting major chassis and engine supports. They're going to be getting upgraded engines from RCR, and their engines are going to be much better, and they will get an enhanced partnership with that organization going next year. On top of that, they are going to be reloc relocating the RCR's main campus. Jay Buford, I believe, has had one top 10 so far this year with the, with the camp so far. And I think Big Machine Racing so far this year has shown a lot of potential with a lot of top 20 and top 25 runs this year. And I do think that this team has potential to take the next step forward. I think by partnering up with Richard Dose Racing going into next year, I do think that this team has a potential to be really, really good. Not to mention, I think Jay Buford is a very solid road course racer. And he had potentially up to seven or eight races going in. Well, he has seven or eight Xfinity Series races going next year that are probably going to be road courses going into the next year. The schedule is really, really impacted with road courses, and I think Jay Buford's a really good road course racer. On top of that, like I said, I think that this team has shown a lot of promise and a lot of potential to be a really good organization, and I think that this is a really, really good move for the organization as a whole to be more involved with the RCR camp. RCR, of course, they have quite a few teams in organization. I know a lot of people look at RCR and say, this isn't a really good move, but you look at RCR, especially in their spinning, and their engines have helped out teams like Brandon Brown's team. And look where Brandon Brown's team has gone this year. They got to win at Talladega, and they were on the verge of making the playoffs this year. You look at Brent Moffitt, where he drives for our motorsports. The our motorsports campus here has shown a lot of speed this year. And now you have this big move where Big Machine Racing is going to get an enhanced partnership. I think it's great for the organization as a whole. And I think, it, and again, I think it going into next year for the Big Machine Racing camp, I think a dig should be going for top 15s and top 20s. Again, I don't expect the team right away to be a championship contender, but I think as time goes on, if they continue to get more enhanced partnerships and organizations, I do think as time goes on and Chevy works with them going forward, I do think that this team could potentially be more of a top 20, again, at least for going in next year. I think that this team will get a lot more top 15s. I think some top 10s for sure. And I think they'll get quite a few top 20s 
going forward into next year. So I think it's a really, really good move as a whole of what they're doing. I know a lot. We said this about Ryan Seek's team when he moved over to Ford and didn't really work out for them. But I think that this is going to be the opposite of that. I think that this team will be able to do really, really good going into next year. I'm really happy for Jay Buford. I know Jay Buford gets a lot of crap, good points. But I think Jay Buford has shown a lot of promise in what he's been able to do. And I think that this move overall is going to make a lot of sense for the organization as a whole. I'm really happy for the Big Machine Racing. Really happy about this move. Like I said, this team has shown a lot this year. And I'm really excited about the team's future. I'm really happy about it for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next major story of today's episode. As we're talking about Michael Lynette. As Michael Lynette announced on Wednesday that he will be retiring from full-time racing at the conclusion of the 2021 season. Now, Michael Lynette, for a lot of you have not been paying attention Michael Annette has not really been racing over the last few weeks due to a leg injury, and also he's been trying to recover from a surgery after leg injury, and he had attempted to make a few starts earlier in, I think, late August going into early September. Unfortunately, he kind of re-agitated that, and agitated those injuries from that surgery, and unfortunately, he's not been able to go out and race over the last few weeks. Josh Berry has been taken over the one. It is unfortunate, it is very unlikely that Michael Annette's career, at least on a full-time basis, is unfortunately going to come to a close. Because I think Michael Annette, while I think a lot of people give him crap, I don't think he's an amazing driver, but I think Michael Annette's a very, very solid driver. The problem with Michael Annette, though, and I've said this for a long time, is I think Michael Annette, unfortunately, underperforms in the equipment he has. He does have one win coming in 2019, and that, of course, was a win at Daytona. Of course, that was a big race where basically everyone ran to the top, but he pretty much dominated the second half of the event, and he was able to go on and win and take the, the car to victory lane. But Michael Nett does bring a little bit of funding, and this unfortunately will affect the funding for the team. He was able to make the playoffs multiple times, and he had a pretty solid career in the NASCAR Xfinity. Now, he did not rule out potentially maybe returning to the Xfinity Series on a part-time basis, so maybe we could see Michael Nett maybe become the driver for the 62 for Beer Motorsports. I still expect that Noah Grayson will probably be that driver for that 62 car at Beer Motorsports, but I think Michael Nett could go there on a part-time basis next year. It is unfortunate this is the end of Michael Nett's career. I don't think Michael Nett wanted to end this way, but I think that what Michael Nett is doing in regards to focusing on his health and safety is really, really good for the team. I also do think that this has an implication on Junior Motorsports because Junior Motorsports has said that they will probably run five cars next year, but that was, of course, if they were able to have Michael Nett return on a full-time basis next year. So I think the driver lineup for Junior Motorsports next year, I think that Sam Mayer or Josh Berry will move over to the one. I think Sam Mayer or Josh Berry will be in the eight. I think Noah Grace will be in the nine, and we'll see Justin Allgaier in the seven next year. Now, we could see a fifth Junior Motorsports car going into next year if Dale Jr. sides run one off, and maybe see a rotation of drivers, but I only right now expect there to be four cars next year. Again, I think Dale Jr. will probably run on a one-off basis next year. Dale Jr. seems to run on a one-off basis, but... Michael Knapp, congrats on a decent career, my guy. You had a pretty solid career in NASCAR, and hopefully you can come back, maybe race on a part-time basis. You never know. He may come out of retirement and drive for a team like Nice Motorsports, and maybe run a dirt race as well at Knoxville for the Truck Series next year. He may run a few starts. Hopefully he will come back really, really soon. I think it's really good, though. He's taking care of his health and safety. I do think that is a very important, and it's unfortunate his career is ending like this, but I think it's really important to take care of your health and safety. And now we're going to jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we are talking about Starcom Racing. Now, we had initially reported that Starcom Racing was going to be shutting down at the end of this year and be seizing operations and that they, it was reported by Charlie Langenstein and myself that he was expected to shut down the organization. Starcom Racing was expected to shut down their organization. Other Penske, their teams, and pick crew members would be leaving the organization. However, there has been a little bit of a curveball that has been thrown into that. As it was announced today, that Cash Grawla will be testing their car this weekend at the Shar Bowl, this upcoming week at the Shar Bowl when the NASCAR Cup Series tests an action car on the Monday and Tuesday. Now, fans are going to be allowed to go to that test that was announced today, but we're going to see Cash Grawla test an action car in the double zero car. Now, one thing that's really important, then thing kind of surprised me a little bit, is Starcom Racing is testing the next gen car. Now, of course, we've seen Chip Ganassi Racing test the next gen car, and then they are, of course, going to be selling their stuff to Trackhouse Racing, and they brought Ross Chastain into the organization, which that makes a lot of sense for them to test the car. So maybe what's going on here is that they are sending their stuff again. Is this something something I find interesting? Is Starcom Racing that they were shutting down, and it looks like that they're not going to be shutting down in general as a whole. Now, apparently, Prop Hawkers had an issue reported that they are still expected to sell their charter 
over to Spire Motorsports for next year. Spire Motorsports is still expecting to have two cars next year and probably a second car going into next year. But they're, they are still going to have infrastructure going into next year. They're still going to have money and parts and pieces for the cars going into next year. So it does look like they may be running on set on only a part-time basis next year. You look at the history of Starcom Racing. Starcom Racing was a team that had a lot of promise in the first years when they had Landing Castle. But ever since they brought Quinn Howe in the organization, I think going last year, I think his team has taken major steps backwards. They have been performing very, very well. They're getting beat right now in points by A.J. Allmendinger in a part-time basis. They only run eight races. And they're getting beat by another team that's run the full season with Ryan Priest. They're getting beat by two unchartered teams this year. And Austin Sinner got looked up his stats coming into this weekend, and he won't be running Cup anymore. But he's only like 40 or 50 points, even less points behind Quinn Howe, and Quinn Howe just has not been performing really, really well this year. I think ever since he brought Quinn Howe in the organization, this team has not been performing very, very well. But the fact that Starcom Racing, they may not be shutting down, definitely throws a really big curveball into the silly season. Now, one big question I have is what does this mean? Now, this, of course, could mean that Starcom Racing could be, of course, using the next-gen chassis. They may be using these chassis to go over and, of course, give that to Spire Motorsports when they run their second car. But I don't entirely think so. I think the Starcom Racing will probably run on a part-time basis next year. And I do think that Kaz Grala will actually probably end up being the driver next year. I really think that that is going to be the case. And the reason I think that overall is going to be the case of him driving a Starcom car is just today, Star he basically took out the call of racing out of his bio. Kaz Grala all year has had, Ka has had call of racing in his bio and other teams in his bio. He does not have any team in his bio right now. So to me, that what that tells me is that he's probably going to end up out of call racing next year. And he may end up driving on a part-time basis in the Cup Series for Starcom Racing, which I think, let's be honest, I think that is a pretty big downgrade from call racing. But again, at the same time, I think that he will perform a lot better than what that team has done with Quinn Howe. I'll be honest with you. I think that they need a much better driver to go into an organization, someone like a Cavs girl or a Brennan Poole. I think Kaz Grawl is a really, really good road course racer. He's done a really, really good job. And I think that if they do go ahead and acquire Kaz Grawl for next year on a part-time basis, if they do run a part-time basis and it's not confirmed what they're doing for next year, and maybe this is just some I'm speculating, but we can see Starcom Racing back next year on a part-time basis. And it'd be really, really cool to see Starcom Racing make a little bit of return next year. Again, I'm not a big fan of the team as a whole. And if they do shut down all together, and this is just a test to show that instead of their stuff over to Spire, I think that this team will perform better. Spire Motorsports is a better team. Or this could also mean that maybe Kaz Grawl is the guy who's going over to Spire Motorsports there and not Ryan Priest. It could be Kaz Grawl going over to that second Spire car, which would make a lot of sense. I think Kaz Grawl deserves to be in the Cup Series on a full-time basis, and maybe that's what it's going to mean going forward. But it's definitely interesting that Star Cup Racing is not potentially shutting down at the end next year. We'll wait and see what happens. So, anyway, that is it for today's NASCAR news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe to the channel, and notification on so you notified when a video does go live on my channel. Follow my Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and support my page as well. Let's get some below for that and comment your thoughts on today's video. Do you think that Starcom Racing will still be shutting down or not? Let me know in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about all the other stories we discussed here today on the channel? Let me know in the comments below. Anyway, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's video. And I'll see you guys next time for some more great and awesome NASCAR content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.